Uh, let's see. Thank you to Kiki Cochran for serving as liturgist, to Connor Fisher for serving as acolyte, to Justin Gibson for greeting, and there she is, to Dr. Almeida Lyer-Well for serving as guest organist today. So we will have special music today shared with us. Um, just a reminder, in the insert in the bulletin, there is the Lenten devotions page uh, for writing a statement of faith. And as you may recall, each week during Lent, which began Wednesday with Ash Wednesday, so from Wednesday to Wednesday, uh, we're focusing on one uh, section of this statement. It's how the confirmands put together with their prayer partners, put together uh, their statement of faith that we used in early February. And it seemed like um, a good project for all of us during Lent to give some thought. I mean, yes, we can say, I believe, but what do we believe? If you take some time, what, you know, what are the key things you believe about God and about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and baptism and communion and the church? And as children of God, how we are to be followers of Jesus. So take a look at this and, you know, breakfast devotions, whatever. See if we can come up with personal statements of belief. And then, uh, let's see, our mission of the month in February is our food box distribution project. And so this is last Sunday in February. If you make donations, clearly mark what it's for. And then Wednesday, we'll need workers at 9 o'clock in the youth side to um, help pack the boxes. And next Saturday, March 4th, well, we begin distributing at 10. We'll need workers a little earlier than that to help move the boxes up the ramp to be uh, distributed. So look, if you're able to help with that, it's much appreciated. And our um, next Sunday will be a first Sunday, a communion Sunday, so our noisy offering. Uh, next Sunday will be for the uh, Polish church helping the Ukrainians. And in other announcements, Evening Guild on March 6th, a week from Monday, we'll have their uh, salad dinner and Lenten quiet hour. Brotherhood St. Patrick's Day dinner, March 13th. Reservations are due by March 8th. And make sure to talk to Dave about that. And we have an interesting program scheduled for that night. Brotherhood meat sale forms are in the bulletin. And the, the deadline for that is March 21st. And Mike, do you want me to do the market or are you? Okay. I don't see Kiki hopping up either. So. Uh, yeah. Well, the ones on Zoom can't hear you if you don't use a mic. Yeah. Okay, we found out uh, Friday Kiki received a notice from a vendor stating that in Granite City, vendors need to have a license, be it a uh, craft person making crafts from their home or whatever. If they sell it in Granite, they need a $35 business license. And so the vendors and crafters that would have been at the fair we had about 24 lined up they would have had to pay an extra $35 for a license and grant it to be here we don't think that's quite right it was passed on January 1st and I went down to the clerk's office with my wife and asked him about it and they said um, churches are not exempt from it that uh, if the crafters the vendors would have given all of their money to the church. They could have done that and not buy a <laughs> license, but that kind of defeats the whole purpose for them being here, too. So basically, we decided to refund money. And the vendors that signed up did send emails back stating that if Granite could get this straightened out, basically, that if we do it again to contact them, they'd still like to participate at the church. So right now, there's nothing coming up with it. So that's where it is. So the city needs money. They're not paying sales tax. And because of that, 
non-for-profits are going to suffer too. So, anyway. Tell them to contact their older but and complain. <laughs> so, that was, it's, you know, it was, it's too close to try to get anything happening and, and still be able to do this. Our date was too close, so. So um, May 7th, no, March 7th, March 7th is the uh, next council, city council meeting and St. Elizabeth was scheduling a, a craft fair in May and so they, um, we've been told that they're planning to go to that meeting and raise questions about it. So if anyone politely wanted to do that and uh, that could be an opportunity. But for now, um, there was only one of the vendors they contacted that did have a license, and there, there really wasn't time. And there's a penalty if we had gone ahead and said, oh, wink, wink, we'll just do it, we could have gotten a pretty good penalty too for not uh, authorized whatever, something or other, in what um, the whole ordinance contains. Okay, the Lenten schedule um, is coming up and our Monday, Thursday, Easter uh, special offerings during uh, in the envelopes for the Lenten envelopes will be designated for Kinder Cottage and we'll have one great hour sharing when you get the Herald, I believe envelopes, I, well I know envelopes were enclosed in the Herald, that's always the fourth Sunday of Lent. And then um, on the Page 10 in the bulletins is the uh, Wednesday noon Lenten community services and um, dinners, luncheons, and that's the schedule. We, during COVID, we were not able to do this, uh, but we're trying it again this year. So you can keep the whole schedule, tear the back page off, and put it on the fridge or whatever. And then in our weekly calendar, um, confirmands are not met yesterday and worked on their projects, so we're not um, not going to have a class today, unless Abby wants a uh, Abby Bailey wants a private class. Okay, and um, game night is tonight, uh, six to eight. And Monday's regular Tuesday, policies and procedures meeting at 10.15. And scatter guard meeting at 5 o'clock out at the Maryville site. Uh, Wednesday, cemetery cleanup at 8.30. They need volunteers uh, starting here at Namioki for cleanup at 8.30. So I guess if, if they clean up real fast, then they can help pack boxes at 9 o'clock or we'll divvy up the workers. And, um, and then Wednesday noon this week, the community service is at Rooted Community Church, formerly St. Peter's, and uh, so that's where it kicks off this week. Thursday, cemetery meeting at 5, and Saturday, food box distribution, and the Illinois South Conference Day of Discipleship. Are there any other announcements? then let us listen for the bells calling us to worship. If Alar was a real doggy, he would need to go to obedience school, wouldn't he? Yes, we took our Dizzy to obedience school and she would just sit and look at us like, you want me to do what? But, uh, but we tried and uh, obedience school did help. Uh, she learned to walk and to sort of heal and not to pull so much. Obedience is a good thing uh, it's a good thing in children. It's a good thing in adults. Like we obey the 
speed limit, right? That's a good thing. Uh, if there's a school bus with flashing lights and the arm out, I hope we obey and stop. Obedience is a lot of times for safety. And it's something that we all need to do. Well, in the scripture today, this is from the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome. And he said, by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, the one man Paul's talking about was Jesus. Because Jesus did as God asked, as God intended. And because, Jesus, because of Jesus' obedience, God's people are saved from sins and from uh, the things that would separate us from God. So that's on a big level, uh, the high level, the sacred level. But we can also remember this on our personal level, that, you know, being obedient helps all of us. It helps everybody. It helps the community. You know, we don't like this rule that the city council has made, but we're going to obey it because there is a purpose, it's a community, something perhaps can be done, but it means that we obey, sometimes for the greater good, sometimes for our own safety, for the safety of others. And I think when we talk about obedience, it's not like fear, oh, if you don't obey me, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw you out in the street. No. He looks at me like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you, know, you know me better than that. But we obey because we want to. Just like we obey God because we want to. We want to do what God wants us to do. So when we think of obeying, let us think of it as for the good of ourselves, for all, and for doing what God wants us to do. Could you fold your hands for a prayer? Dear God, we thank you that you give us direction and that you want to keep us safe and that you want to save us, that you do save us. Help us to respond and to obey as best as we possibly can and so that we may be safe and we may know that always your love is with us forever and ever even if we fall, that you are with us and love us and lift us back up. Help us and strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So.
Let us join in the responsive call to worship and prayer. Temptation surrounds us every day. Happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Opportunities to stray litter our path. Happy are those whose sin is covered. Though we stumble and fall, God's mercy picks us up. God's grace brushes us off. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. God's love meets us here. Let us pray together. God of wilderness wanderings, many things tempt us. Many forces cause our feet to stray. Save us from the time of trial, for we easily succumb to temptation. We often heed voices that cause us to stray. Return us to the garden of your abiding love, for we yearn to walk with you with faithful hearts and upright spirits. Amen. We worship the one who forgives our transgressions and covers our sin. Rejoice and be glad, for God's mercy is greater than our failings. God's grace is greater than our sin. Let us join in the responsive Psalter reading from Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, 
and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. You may be seated. The scripture reading today is Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves.
Our gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Listen for the good news of the gospel. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on Jesus. Thanks be to God for this lesson. May the Holy Spirit inspire the presentation and hearing of this sermon, that we might learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Every year, the season of Lent begins with a gospel lesson about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness after 40 days and nights of fasting. One of the gospel translations begins this story with, Then the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. So a groaner joke is to ask, What kind of car the Spirit drives since it drove Jesus into the wilderness? Yes, pretty pathetic. You're shaking your heads. I know. It is pathetic. But you know something? We at least have a clue as to the root of that joke, especially right after hearing the gospel led. There are a lot of people who would have no clue. They couldn't begin to fathom what the jokester is even talking about. It would just sort of be like, huh? They might know of Jesus, but not the spirit and not the wilderness of temptation. If we are tempted to say, well, what's wrong with those people? Why don't they get out and go to church and learn and worship? Well, then we are the ones giving in to temptation, the temptation to judge and to condemn others from our holier-than-thou high horse. Rather than asking what's wrong with them, maybe the question should be, how can we invite and encourage them to grow in faith through church participation? I'm not saying that we are doing something wrong or actively excluding others, but we can do more to actively invite, welcome, and include others. Evangelism happens in many ways when we sincerely try to do more, more inviting and bringing of friends and family, more talking positively about what our faith and church life means for us, not in a smug way, but in a genuinely joyful way. Even when we're angry about something, we're joyful for the church. And with more activities, in addition to worship, to bring people into a comfort level or awareness of the joy and good of church life. The temptation to keep quiet out of fear of sounding preachy or pushy. The temptation to keep quiet because that little devilish voice says, God talk isn't popular and you don't want to be cast out by friends and family. 
I can be overcome by positive joy in the example set by sharing faith and inviting others, not into a wilderness, but into the church. For Jesus began his public ministry that has led to the church with his baptism by John the Baptist and the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Today's gospel lesson began with, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. So the word then refers to this being the next event after his baptism. It is interesting to me that after Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the tempter came to him. The number 40 in the Bible generally refers to a period of testing, trial, or probation, and is used 146 times, according to the uh, book I read, through the Bible. No, I didn't go through and count 146 times. I just believed somebody who did. Moses had more than one 40-day or year time of something special in his life. Noah, Jonah, Elijah, and Ezekiel had theirs, as did more prophets, kings, and peoples. Jesus ascended to heaven 40 days after his resurrection, so his ministry on earth began and ended with 40-day periods. Are all these measurements of 40 to be taken literally, or do they symbolize a period of testing? trial or probation. Perhaps as we enter the 40 days of Lent, not including Sundays, we should reflect on what we are experiencing in these 40 days. Are we preparing ourselves by testing our strength against temptation? Are we preparing as God would have us prepare to journey with Jesus to the cross, tomb, and resurrection? When we think of the term probation, we probably think of someone who has done something wrong but is given a chance to show they can do right. Maybe we have not done wrong by our faith, but there may be more that we can do right. Lent reminds us and inspires us to do what God asks of us, just as Jesus did in the wilderness. What does Jesus' time in the wilderness teach us about living faithfully? For one thing, it shows that temptation comes to everyone. Everyone. In the Lord's Prayer, we usually say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We pray not to be led into temptation, but you know, we still find temptation on our own and we ask God to deliver us. As we consider the temptations Jesus faced, we see that we still find them today in one form or another. Jesus' temptations were challenges to his role as the beloved Son of God. Would he remain strong and true to his mission? Well, of course he would. Doctrinally, he was being true to himself in the Trinity of God. We would not doubt his faithfulness, but do we ever doubt our own? First, the tempter tempted Jesus to use his power to satisfy his personal need, his hunger, rather than trust God to meet his need. Jesus trusted God. Do we? It's not as easy as it sounds, though. Do you think the homeless person looking for a meal trusts God to provide, maybe through God's people? When the expected income tax refund instead turns into a big tax bill, do we trust God to provide? What happens when we take a literal sense of the material needs to be miraculously met by God? Do we test God to see if God comes through and abandon God if our personal needs are not met? 
And if somehow the miraculous help does come through, which occasionally does happen, do we think God has passed our test this time? Or do we remember that Jesus' physical hunger never separated him from God? Nor do our personal needs ever separate us from God, no matter what happens. Nothing, nothing can cause us to turn away from God. And next, Jesus was tempted to separate himself from the potential for danger and to test God's promise, although the tempter pulled scripture out of context to test Jesus, not God. But Jesus knew his scripture too, and he refused to use his power to keep himself from danger. Now remember, this was the beginning of his ministry, and we know the danger that came later in Jerusalem. But for us, are we ever tempted to play it safe and not take any risks for the sake of living our faith? No, we aren't to jump off the bell tower or something foolish like that, take foolish risks to prove our faith. But we may be tempted to hold back from doing what we can, from evangelizing, from giving, from serving, from meeting needs that we can meet, if we fear that there is even a slight risk involved. There are times we play it too safe and separate ourselves from the risks our faith does encourage us to take. Nothing, however, should cause us to turn away from God. The third temptation Jesus faced was power, personal power, seemingly even power over God. Now, doctrinally, Jesus already had the power of God, but the tempter tried to fake him out by offering more power. Of course, God's power is total, but Jesus did not need to call on it to overcome this temptation. He declared God is the only one to worship, and thus God has the power and authority over everything. It's fairly easy to see where we are tempted today when choosing to give power to human things, human-made things, like the idols of money, beauty, prestige, winning over others, and more. When we are tempted to beat out the others or to claim to be the greatest of all, to be arrogant and refuse to serve anyone or anything that we consider to be beneath us, we separate ourselves from honoring and glorifying the power of God. Therefore, we will not make ourselves into egotistical little gods. Nothing can make us turn away from the awesome power of the one true God. Nothing, not even the tempters of today, can separate us from the power and love of God. In the story of the temptation of Eve and Adam, they failed. But they did not die of physical death as punishment. The love of God was greater than the disappointment of God. Their lives were changed. Their relationship with God and each other was changed. But God's love continued. Throughout all the ages of humanity, people have tested God's love, but it is steadfast. Jesus is the signature of God's love and mercy. Jesus is the signature of God's love and mercy. And so Jesus overcame all the temptations thrown at him and won the battle of wits with his responses. While it's not in scripture, maybe, just maybe, he remembered the words from heaven at his baptism. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased, and knew that God, again, was well pleased. I think we may feel that same assurance when we turn to God and when we face down temptations of every kind in our lives. We can trust that God is with us through it all. 
and that ultimately we will receive an A++ when the tests of this life are behind us and the glory of eternity is before us. As we take our annual 40-day Lenten journey, walking especially close with Jesus, may we pay particular attention to how we model his perfect trust in God at all times. If we are tempted to give up and turn aside, to be weak and afraid to step up, or to be too busy getting ahead to bother, may the Spirit drive us in a new direction so that we take the faithful road into the future. Amen. seated. As we begin our time of prayer, we remember those in nursing and assisted and independent living. Earl Binger, Marsha Binger, Ruth Buer, Hilde Few, Joanne King, Karen Ludicky, Leonard Schaefer, and Jerry Schank. At home, Karen Anders, Chloe Affalter, Isabella Boyer, Carol Braunmeier, Christopher Clark, Myra Cook, Bonnie Forneszewski, Mary Franz, Lukard Fries, Melba Grady, Lou Hassey, Norman Henty, Chuck King, Cindy Meyer, Sandy Mueller, Cliff Robertson, Merle Rose, Marge Schmidt, June Stilley, and Nancy Wilson. And in the Illinois South Conference, Morrow, St. John UCC at Midway, Reverend Laurie and Wayne Schaefer, Du Bois Center, Noah McCarn, Executive Director, and retired pastor, Reverend Dr. Richard and Johan uh, Elabraki in Lebanon. And we uh, remember in our prayers, Abby Comer, who is having gallbladder surgery tomorrow. So uh, keep Abby and Ruth and Dan and all the family in prayers, gallbladder surgery tomorrow. Additional concerns or celebrations? 
Connie. Connie's brother, Alan Kester, is having a total knee replacement tomorrow. So prayers for a good surgery and speedy recovery. Patient recovery. <laughs> patient recovery? Pa patient as in patience. <laughs> Anyone else? We have had an up and down and up and down with uh, my stepsister in the past week with one doctor saying it's a cancerous sped to her brain and the next one saying no, it's a stroke and then the next one saying no, it's not at all and it's, the tumors are getting smaller in her lung, kidney and liver. So it's all over the place and she has an appointment March 9th at UCLA uh, with a specialist in this part particular kind of cancer that she's dealing with. So we'll hope to get some, well, clear answers and some good answers. Anyone else? Then let us be in a spirit of prayer. On this first Sunday in Lent, we once again promise to walk the Lenten journey with you, O Lord. Help us keep our promise in spiritually healthy ways. Help us choose to take positive steps for renewal of a right spirit in our lives and relationships. Help us give and seek forgiveness of others and ourselves. As we walk the Lenten journey with you, O Lord, we share joys and concerns for those who walk with us. Thank you for a touch of spring to remind us that life renews again. Even as we pray for those dealing with shocking blizzards and the threats of windstorms and the aftermath of earthquakes, we pray for those struggling with illness or sorrow or danger. Remind us that death means life for eternity. Remind us that we do not face illness or death alone and help us to feel your presence. We pray for those who hold power in the governments of every nation and of every level, including local. Remind them that power is to be tempered with responsibility, righteousness, wisdom, and consensus, so that compassion and peace are shared for the good of all. Thank you for being present in our joys. Our confirmands are journeying toward confirming their faith and preparing to share it with us. Remind us that joy shared is multiplied in so many ways for everyone. Remind us that as we practice good feelings, we show what life with you truly is. Remind us to be happy as your faithful people. Throughout this Lenten journey, O oh Lord, draw us close to you in obedience and help us keep our priorities in order as we promise to worship you alone in all that we do. Receive our prayers and strengthen us as we pray together as Jesus teaches, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we present our gifts and our Lenten offerings, and as we present our, our hearts and our intentions, let us do so with joy, for we are joyful servants of the one true God.
would you join me in the unison prayer of dedication? Merciful one, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Still, we seek your blessing upon this offering, for many are hungry and need food. Many are naked and need clothes. Many are homeless and need shelter. May these gifts reflect the depth of our gratitude as they go into the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. begun our Lenten journey, we have gathered to worship God, and now we go out to serve in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 